Welcome everyone to the second event in our Civil Rights at a Crossroads series. The series is a collaboration between the Shriver Center on Poverty Law and the Sergeant Shriver Peace Institute. This is my 10th year with the Sergeant Shriver Peace Institute and my first as the executive director. I'd like to express my gratitude to Audra and the team at the Shriver Center for entering into this collaboration with us. Today's event, Rewriting History, Reversing Progress, focuses on an issue that requires attention on all our part. The efforts to block the learning about the history of racism and white supremacy in the US and the failure to acknowledge the ways in which white supremacy has shaped our institutions, resulting in centuries of injustice, poverty and violence for black Americans. I'd like to start us off by sharing Sergeant Shriver's own views on this issue. Shriver understood the importance of confronting the legacy of racism and white supremacy in the United States. And he believed that this legacy prevented us from achieving the promises of equality and liberty for all that had been articulated in the Declaration of Independence. In the 1950s, while living in Chicago, Shriver addressed the issue of racism head on. Serving as the head of the Board of Education and the Catholic Interracial Council, he worked to desegregate Catholic high schools and other institutions in the city. In his 1956 address to the Sierra Club, he was blunt in his description of the dangers of white supremacy. He said, and I quote, I believe that any American who holds to the theory of white supremacy and actively promotes the political, economic, and social restrictions and segregation necessary to make the theory of white supremacy effective must be classed with those who are willing to undermine their country's strength in the face of the enemy. Later in his seminal 1958 speech, The Roots of Racism, he delineated the dangerous human tendencies that allowed racism to flourish. And I quote again, the roots of racism lie deep in man's nature, wounded and bruised by original sin. The secret sources of racism lie deep in man's greed for a cheap labor supply, deep in man's insecurity about his own means of livelihood, deep in man's desire for aristocratic distinction, his desire to feel that he is a member of a distinguished people, an elite better to, than other human beings, deep in his anxiety to be somebody, to belong to a group which does not include everyone, to be free of his fear of sinking into the great struggling, undifferentiated mass of humanity. Creating an environment that allows us to achieve the equitable and just society that Sergeant Shriver envisioned will take intentional persistent, persistent effort on all our parts and will involve the coming together of diverse groups whose common goal is to achieve such a society. Groups like the one we've assembled here today. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panel now. Molly Minta covers higher education for the nonprofit news organization, Mississippi Today. Molly is a finalist for this year's National Awards for Education Reporting for her story, Inside Mississippi's Only Class on Critical Race Theory. Molly's reporting has shed light on what critical race theory is and is not, and has brought attention to the conservative push to ban the theory. Prior to joining Mississippi Today, Molly worked for The Nation, The Appeal, and Mother Jones. Sydney Wallace sits on the board of the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs and was co-founder of Cole Orr, JCUA's Jews of Color Caucus. As an advocate for police accountability, Sydney created content for and facilitated JCUA's first ever racial justice training for members and the Congregation Partner Racial Justice Training. Sydney is an alum of the Avodah Justice Fellowship, a diverse community of people who are passionate about exploring justice, Jewish life, and the powerful intersections between the two. Next, we have our own Audra Wilson, the president and CEO of the Shriver Center. Audra began her legal career as a welfare advocacy, advocacy attorney with the Shriver Center on Poverty Law. She continued to shape policy in various roles, including as deputy press secretary and policy director for Barack Obama's US Senate campaign. Before returning to the Shriver Center in 2020, she was executive director of the League of Women Voters of Illinois. Audra serves on multiple boards and committees, including as chair of the Cook County Commission on Women's Issues. 
Our moderator for today's discussion, Adam Green, is Associate Professor in the Departments of History and Race, Diaspora and Indigeneity at the University of Chicago. His field specialties include modern US history, African American history, urban history, comparative racial politics, and cultural economy. He is currently involved in a Columbia University project to create the official oral history of the Obama presidency. And last but not least, Adam is a longtime collaborator of the Sargent Shriver Peace Institute. He appeared in the documentary, American Idealist, the story of Sergeant Shriver, contributed to the planning and proposal of the Sargent Shriver Fellows Program at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, and is leading the efforts to annotate the forthcoming posthumous memoir by Sergeant Shriver, We Called It a War. The memoir, which will be out later this year, outlines Sergeant Shriver's efforts to lead the war on poverty. Before I hand things over to Adam, just some technical tips. Uh, if you look at the top right of your screen, you'll see a chat tab, which you can use to connect with us and be in community. You can toggle between that and the Q&A tab during the discussion to ask questions. If you could test out the chat box right now by typing your name and location, we'd love you to share who you are and where you're from. Please keep the conversation by type, please keep the conversation flowing by typing and sharing comments and questions throughout the event. And one last tip, please do stay until the end of the event because we'll be giving away a few prizes. Without further ado, I'll hand things over to our moderator, Professor Adam Green. Thank you so much, Lucy. And uh, like everyone, we're really looking forward to this discussion and this panel. Let's go right into it. Uh, we have five rounds uh, where we will each have the opportunity to speak to questions that come up in relation to one or another theme in terms of the controversies and issues around the struggle to suppress critical race theory. Round one, the attacks on critical race theory are widespread, whether they're taking place in classrooms or the broader community. College curriculum on race are being, is being canceled. Books are being banned. Libraries are being defunded. Racist legislation is being passed. Like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's Stop Woke Act, which bans schools and businesses from teaching anything that would cause anyone to feel guilt or distress due to their race, gender, and more. Before we go to our panelists, let's take a quick poll with our audience. How many pending bills against critical race theory do you think there are? A question should pop up on your screen. Click to choose your answer. Are you curious about the audience poll results? Go to the top right corner and click on the polling tab. The actual answer, according to PEN America. As of April 26th, there are over 85 pending bills in the United States. So question to the panel, why should the attacks on critical race theory concern all of us? Audra, maybe we could start with you. Thanks so much, Adam. And thank you to everybody who is watching us today. So I'll be honest, as a, as a lawyer and an adjunct professor of law, my, my first instinct is always to explain what CRT or critical race theory really is particularly because it was developed by several prominent black legal scholars in the mid 1970s, including Derrick Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw. And I sometimes tell people that it's just a methodical analysis into the social construct of race and its relationship to law and society. And that historically it has been taught in law schools or at a graduate level. And sometimes I feel like I should be defending the mischaracterization of critical race theory or CRT um, as these attacks that say it's, it's focusing on vilifying white people or branding them as inherently prejudiced. And I tell folks to the contrary, it's, it's, it's meant to depersonalize discussions about individual prejudice and bigotry, bigotry and instead focuses on how racism has molded our structures and our systems. But the really important point here is that this attack that we're seeing on a nearly 50 year old graduate or legal level course of study is completely and intentionally disingenuous. The biggest opponents of CRT, and those are the people who've intentionally sought to mischaracterize it, have done so to hide the fact 
that racism is not merely a deviation from an otherwise well-functioning system. Racism is infrastructural, and it is deeply embedded within our legal, social, economic, and political systems. And racism is part of the origin story of the United States, where human beings were captured and ripped away from their homelands to settle a land that was already occupied for generations. Racism has molded and shaped the country in which we all live currently. Now, as a head of a national nonprofit that seeks to disrupt and dismantle those very systems that keep so many people mired in poverty, I am particularly concerned about this characterization or mischaracterization of critical race theory and any sort of effort um, afoot to give historically accurate uh, representations of peoples in the United States to talk honestly about our history. And I actually wrote a blog over a year ago talking about that for those of us who are also advocates for racial and economic justice, saying that these attacks that we're now talking about 85, and I'm sure as of today, there's even more. Uh, these attacks are actually undermining the work that we do as advocates, because if we're trying to, to, to dismantle those systems that keep people mired in poverty, and you now rewrite history to say, there are no systems. All that has been eradicated through legislation, it no longer exists, slavery was, it was almost 200 years ago. Um, if you believe that, then there's no basis for the work that we're doing today. And we know as advocates, we know just generally that that's absolutely not true. The bottom line is this, no one who lives in this country, whether you were born here, whether you emigrated here, no one is immune from the impacts of American racism. And some of us benefit from the privileges that racism bestows, and some of us must wrestle with the disadvantages and the inequities that it has created. That's just a fact. Audra, thank you for that. Molly, if you could also provide your perspective on how this is an issue that should concern all of us, that would be great. Sure. Um, so one thing, one, one part of this that I think is particularly significant is that, um, and Audra kind of referenced this, um, the attack or the panic around critical race theory is explicitly, was kind of created as a Trojan horse or like a test case to spread far right conservative policies. Um, there's been a lot of reporting over the last three years that has showed that the like media panic and the resulting legislation can be traced in large part back to Christopher Rufo, who's this conservative activist and a fellow at the right wing Manhattan Institute. Uh, like we talked about the Stop Woke Act, he was there for the signing of the Stop Woke Act in Florida. Um, but he picked critical race theory because he thought that this term um, would be vague enough that he could kind of like strip it of the actual historical meaning it has within the development of American legal scholarship and then just attribute any meaning he wanted to it. And in his own words, he said that he he thought it could become a vehicle for, quote, the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Um, and I think we see now Rufo has turned his attention to LGBTQ people. Um, and we can see that state legislatures are kind of passing laws targeting the trans community. Often there's overlap between the anti critical race theory laws um, and the bills that are targeting the trans community, some of the CRT bills like ban the discussion of gender identity. Um, so uh, in Mississippi, we see that happening too. Last year we had an anti-critical race theory bill and then this year we had an anti-gender affirming care bill. So it's all kind of part of the same thing, um, but I think it's important to kind of understand how these attacks happen and the process by which um, Christopher Rufo and other conservative activists are sort of seeking to create terms that have very specific historical meanings um, that are important to the development of progressive thought in the U.S. and then kind of strip them of all that meaning and reframe it into whatever context they'd like. Thank you for that, Molly. Understanding the intentionality of the attacks and the ways in which they have to do with other priorities seems very, very important. Sydney, if you could also share your thoughts in relation to how this is something that could, should concern all people um, from your perspective and in relation to your experience and commitments. I'm, I'm kind of hard pressed to think of why attacks on CRT wouldn't concern everyone. 
uh, while CRT obviously focuses on looking at our history through a racial lens to bring to the forefront the ways in which policies and societal behaviors shaped uh, shaped and shape the lives and culture in which we all live, it's not hard to see that by suppressing and making the pursuit of understanding where we've come from taboo, that other aspects of our country could also be attacked. Um, right now, it's attacking a lot of the marginalized groups and groups that have already been attacked, but it's not hard to see that eventually it could be union workers or even our veterans, people that are considered to be as American as American can be. You know, just off the top of my head, uh, union workers are, are often portrayed as being lazy or entitled, or our veterans, uh, they're, they're called heroes uh, initially until they need help from us, uh, as we should help them. Um, they are being portrayed as, you know, killers or as deserving of the astronomical homelessness rates that are among their ranks. Um, all of that is easily able to happen because we don't have the common knowledge, the history of how and why they came to be the way that they are. It isn't taught, it isn't widely discussed. And when you don't have that context, you can shape the narrative the way you want it to be. Thank you, thank you very much for that, Sydney. And it's a great segue into the second round of questions, which has to do with thinking about the ways in which we understand the past shaping the choices and the priorities we make in the present and going forward in the future. Round two, history and how it's taught is a powerful tool to help shape the future. The premise of critical race theory, which is not only in, taught in higher education, is that racism, as Audra was just pointing out, is not just personal bias and prejudice toward individuals. It's institutional, systemic, and structural, which is why policy plays such a key role in advancing justice. So second question, how can we shine a light on the racist and unjust policies of the past, which continue to produce inequitable outcomes and create more equitable laws and policies? Molly, perhaps you could start with that. Sure. Um, I, I might be biased because I am a journalist, but I do think this is where journalism can be incredibly important and helpful, particularly as a way of translating and explaining what can be difficult or unfamiliar concepts for people in their day-to-day -day lives or people who kind of maybe didn't go to college. Um, just sometimes translating and unpacking like what is a systemic issue, what is a structural issue, and then what what is the relationship between that and something you might experience in your everyday life, I think is super important just for creating consciousness. Um, you know, I, I cover higher education and a huge part of my day-to-day -day work as a journalist is understanding the historical backdrop and the systemic forces um, that have, in Mississippi, for example, led to there being five predominantly white institutions. The three of those are the biggest universities in the state and then three HBCUs that have been underfunded in comparison historically. Um, so I think like when you can kind of demonstrate and unpack, you know, this is why uh, in your day-to-day -day life, uh, the university system in Mississippi looks like that. I think it's a lot easier for people to feel like they can have some kind of impact on the system if they understand um, the root cause of why their world looks the way it does. Thank you for that, Molly. I want to go over now to Sydney and then next to Audra, but I just want to underscore a point which seems very, very important, which perhaps we can get to in this round or later on, which is that Molly points out correctly that education as a resource is unequally available in relation to this society. And we presume that this is a fight over higher education and the university. Of course, in many cases, it's K through 12 education. The majority of Americans actually do not have access to college or to graduate education as a means to be able to encounter ideas or works or some of the ways in which one can critically interpret institutions. So thinking about solutions to this means also confronting some of the inequality that exists within our system. Sydney, maybe we could start with you and then go over to Audra to further comment on this idea of how we bring light to these unjust policies and create the conditions for more equitable laws and policies. Yeah, uh, again, for me, it comes down to education. 
Um, that doesn't have to be a long lecture for higher education specifically pointing out why this policy or that is rooted in racist stereotypes or ideals. It could be as simple as encouraging our children to question and encourage our adults to answer them in an age appropriate manner. Um, we all know that a stop sign is red, but why is it red? What was the process that went behind deciding that's how we do it? What were the other options and why didn't we go with those? We need to move our society to a place where we not only feel comfortable asking questions, but also seeking out answers ourselves instead of relying on someone to tell us what they think we should and shouldn't know. Thank you for that, Sydney. And Audra, what are your thoughts on this? Thanks, Adam. It's interesting. I'm picking up on something Sydney just said about being told what we should or shouldn't know. I am a mother of a, uh, a high school freshman, but when she was in eighth grade, she read for the first time Fahrenheit 451. And for those of you who have not read this with Ray Bradbury, and this is a book that's probably 60 years old, the, the premise of this was basically having society at a point where we don't use books anymore. We said so we create these narratives and then we will relay those narratives to people so that they don't have to worry about anything else. Um, and that we can create a narrative however we see fit and you don't have to see, seek it in a book. You don't have to seek education. You don't have to seek anything else. And those who were curious about, well, what are in these books that were a thing of the past? Why we are books banned? Why can't we see books anymore? they unfortunately are penalized for that and it's weird to be in this moment in time now where we're having this conversation about this fictitious book and yet this is where we sit we we know the the variation of that that, that saying about history being bound to repeat itself and we know that you can't fix what you don't acknowledge we understand this concept we talk about this we we probably have it in one of our slides and one of our quotes for today um, but yet we find ourselves having this conversation about ex talking about history and why we need to learn from history and we cannot run away from it. But I do want to note that even though education is important and it's crucial at all levels, we talked about the inequity of education, that Molly has talked about the importance of the, the press and the media and, and being one of those vehicles to actually help to inform. These conversations are being had within every sector. Uh, they're being had at every level. I think there's a level of conversation that has deeper than than there ever has been in recent history. I think what we're seeing seeing right now is a very vocal and vociferous backlash to those conversations because the conversations are actually meaningful and they are impactful. That's why there's so much resistance and that's why there's so much backlash and that's why there are these efforts to, to rewrite history. But I do want to acknowledge the fact that I think many people, especially those who are on this call today, are, are engaged in these conversations. They want to learn more. They recognize that there's things that are not being taught and that they didn't know themselves. So I want to make sure that we acknowledge that. But it's important for us to really have this clear line of demarcation. We know that there are many who don't want to acknowledge American racism because they fear that they may lose the advantages that have been bestowed upon them um, by American racism. But I'm always the optimist. I haven't given up on people as yet. Um, and I know that once we understand that there are many things for which we are the beneficiaries of that we did not create, um, that we can use that as a starting point to have these conversations, to talk about how we can use those advantages and those privileges in a way that is affirmative and that is positive. And that is why education is so important. That is why these conversations are so important. That is why it's so important that so many of you have just joined us today and are spreading this link and spreading word about these conversations and continue to have them. But I did just want to acknowledge the fact that, that there are conversations being had in all sectors and we do need to acknowledge them. We need to uplift them and we need to continue to encourage them. Thanks for that, Audra. We want to go over to round three and the next question, but before we do that, let me just repeat that we are very, very interested in hearing from those uh, attending and listening to bring your questions in through the chat so that we can look at them as we're going forward with the conversation and try to think about the points that are being raised by audience members in terms of how to dig deeper into this issue. Thank you. Let's move to round three. We have a rich and factually accurate set of resources about race and racism to consult in this country.
from a people's history of the United States to more recently, the 1619 Project. On the flip side, there are false narratives that are rampant, especially now during the digital age. And newsrooms across the country have been decimated, making it more and more difficult to cover, criticize, and counter uh, these false narratives. Reporters can be said to create the first rough draft of history. Um, quality journalism can be found, uh, can be seen as one of our most trusted sources of information about the world around us, but local news is disappearing. Recent studies paint a grim picture of the impact that this decline is having on our politics. Let's take a quick poll with our audience. How many newspapers do you think have closed since 2004? Questions should pop up on your screen. Click to choose your answer. Are you curious about the audience poll results? Go to the top right corner and click on the polling tab. The actual answer, according to PEN America again, since 2004, more than 1,800 newspapers have closed in the United States. Question to the panel. How do we effectively respond to racist narratives in our fight for racial and economic justice? What are the ways that we can overcome the spread of misinformation and disinformation on social media, in our school boards, at city council meetings, and so on? Molly, maybe you could start with that question. I think this is a fascinating question, um, and it reminds me of something that we love to talk about in journalism, which is complicating the narrative. Um, it's like a pithy phrase to kind of get you to think a bit outside of the box um, of what people are telling you and how you present information. Um, and one story I think often about in the course of having reported in Mississippi is that um, in 1619, 16, sorry, 1969, there was a protest at a college in the Mississippi Delta called Delta State University. Um, it had just been integrated by Black students, um, only for them to encounter racist teachers, racist fellow students, courses on literature and history that were completely centered white people, um, like there are no Black teachers or Black guidance counselors. So these students organized and they um, held a sit-in in front of the president's office. As a result, the police were called and all 52 black students were arrested and sent to Parchman. Um, I was doing historical research in the archives at Delta State University because I had wanted to write a story about this as there were some students who were filming a documentary about it, um, sort of like a anniversary of um, this event. Um, and one thing that one anecdote I found in the archives and that the, the archivist there who helped me sort of told me more about was that there was one white student who was among this group who was also arrested and sent to Parchman. And eyewitnesses had recalled him being so upset to see the police like leading black students onto the jail bus that he like insisted if they were going to arrest everyone, they had to arrest him to some kind of like defiant protest. And then he also got, they were like, well, okay. <laughs> um, but the next day there was a local paper, the Delta Democrat Times that ran a story quoting his parents who were involved in like a local church. Basically the whole story consisted of the parents explaining that their son most definitely was not participating in the protest, but that he had just been arrested accidentally. Um, and that I think is a, I think that there are so many stories from the civil rights movement where local papers completely distorted the events of what happened at a protest, painted protesters in um, a racist light. And in fact, like this story is probably one of the less harmful anecdotes because it just concerned this kid. Um, but I think it's just important to understand like historically the way that local news in the US has operated in many cases, like particularly local papers um, with local advert advertisers have been reflective of the um, opinions of people who had like wealth and power in the, those societies. Um, and even today, like we have conservative TV stations that are claiming crime waves are happening, but they're not. There are so many conservative radio stations. Um, so it's, it's tricky because I think that this is like a long rooted historical problem in this country. Um, I would say, you know, 
this it's a huge task, but overcoming misinformation and disinformation, a huge part of that is just getting actually good publications to the right audiences, you know, increasing readership, um, trying to rebuild, and also especially like trying to rebuild people's like the marginalized groups who have been historically mistreated by newspapers, like their trust in local news as well. Thank you for that, Molly. It feels like uh, it's taking a page from Audra's characterization of the analysis of critical race theory in a more official or original sense, which is that this is embedded in all structures and all institutions in society. So that whether you are in academia, whether you're in churches, whether you're in journalism, you, you have to be vigilant in relation to thinking about the ways in which both sensibilities and languages make it often very, very difficult to resist a kind of normative prejudice that you have to really find ways to root that out and take up new practices. Audra, uh, do you have thoughts in relation to this to share as well? So what Molly just described, I, I, I hope people recognize there's a, a really sad and strange irony to a characterization where here is a student, a white student who is, is feeling a certain kind of way um, about what they're witnessing. And the parents are saying, no, 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 that's not what you saw. Like, so you're not seeing the reaction that you thought that you saw. When we talk about uh, not even just critical race theory, but any sort of whitewashing, sanitizing, uh, rewriting of history, the irony is that you're actually rewriting the history of white people as well. It's not just taking away my identity as, as a black person, as a black woman. It's not just taking away the identities and the stories and narratives of indigenous people, of any people of color, any other marginalized people. It is actually altering white history. There is a legacy of white advocacy um, of, of not only with the civil rights movement, from as early as the abolitionist movement, there are people who have con basically contradicted, they've spoken out against what they see as hate and intolerance and prejudice with personal at personal peril. Because we're talking about a time in the country where this was this was the uh, de jure, it was legalized discrimination, it was Jim Crow, it was times where discrimination was something that was just part and parcel. So to have the courage to speak out against, to say something against, to rally against, to put yourself in peril, this is a history of, of white advocacy. And so it's interesting that as we try to whitewash and sanitize, you're actually erasing the history that shows that there are people who are willing to be to be brave and to counteract that. So it's just yet another example of why when we do not have these conversations, when we try to 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 litigate out, you know, any sort of reference of racism, um, that we are actually altering all of our histories in a very negative way. So I think we have to really be thinking about how we have these conversations, especially now that we know with newspapers um, and how and other media outlets that we know sometimes are skewing one way or the other. And the fact that our attention spans collectively have gotten much shorter, especially with social media. I'm almost feeling like we're going back to more of an oral tradition in addition to um, a different sort of format where we're conveying real information. The fact that all of you are here engaged in this conversation, listening, open to hearing something different than perhaps you've heard before is an important step. But you cannot be afraid to challenge, to question, to, to speak out. And you cannot be afraid to either call, cause discomfort when you're starting to question people, even who are close to you, who have things and opinions that in your gut, you say something does not seem right. I think this is wrong. You, you have to have the courage to be able to, to confront them and, and cause some discomfort. And sometimes you may be sitting in discomfort, um, but that is, is so imperative if we're going to move forward in a very positive way and we're really going to the root causes of racism. And of course, we will continue as best as possible through the media um, and in these sorts of conversations to be able to give real facts that people can use in those arguments when they're dealing with people who are kind of spewing stuff that you know is nonsense, that you know is just absolutely not true. So one example that I give when um, we talk about why people should be concerned about racism and, uh, you know, generally speaking, I remind people that there is actual an economic cost to racism. Um, so this has been discussed by Heather McGee, uh, who wrote The Some of Us, 
Dr. Ibram Kendi and many other scholars um, that talk about their actual economic costs to American racism. And even Citigroup did a study that said that in a given year, I think by 2020, $16 billion, billion dollars was lost by um, racially discriminatory policies, uh, especially in lending and other sectors um, as a consequence of American racism. So using actual facts to say, no, this isn't just something we feel uncomfortable with. There's a cost to all of us and we have to continue to impart um, that fact um, that it, it, this is something that we all need to understand so that we can move forward together and move forward as a society. Audra, thanks very much for that. We want to go over to round four, but we're, we're moving along reasonably well. So I might just ask a follow-up question that may be of interest and helpful to the audience as well as one for us to exchange thoughts on, which is that we do have to have these conversations that you were just mentioning, Audra, and we do need to find ways to populate those conversations with facts. Can really any of the three of you share some thoughts and some tips about how to have those conversations with people who are inclined to disagree or dismiss that this is something that they should be concerned with? So in a certain sense, maybe a follow-up on round one, but I think that we find it sometimes easy to talk about these questions or relatively straightforward when people know where we're coming from and what the cues are and that we've read the same books and such. But how do we actually break down the resistance to even hearing the conversation at the start? I think all three of you have insights in relation to that. And perhaps we could just take a little bit of time to talk about that directly. Uh, maybe we could start with, uh, with Molly on that one. Sure. Um... What immediately came to my mind was, and this is also just the mode I operate in on most days as a journalist, is um, asking questions and trying to kind of have, you know, the, the other person you're talking to get them to unpack their point of view. I think so, so much of journalism is interviewing people who you maybe personally don't agree with, but you need to represent their opinion and the story that you're writing. So you need to be able to understand it. Um, and that requires, you know, approaching somebody in an open, friendly manner, not making them feel like you're kind of going to misrepresent their opinion or belittle them um, in some way. And then, you know, being uh, thoughtful and like a, an active participant um, as they're telling you things. Um, and I think I that can be a tricky thing to do, especially if you're somebody who's very passionate um, or the per other person has like, frankly, abhorrent points of view, I think like exercising, you know, a judiciousness in terms of, you know, what, who is somebody I can actually kind of have, you know, as you're asking questions, like go deeper with versus who's someone who kind of, it's not that deep They They might just have hateful viewpoints. Um, but I think, I don't know. I feel like it, when I'm outside of, the office, just like in my day-to-day -day life, I often wish that people would ask each other more questions um, and try, you know, through that process, try to get people to explain themselves better. Um, I don't think it's like a panacea by any means, but I do think it's a useful tool that um, I think people should employ more. Thanks for that, Molly. Audra or Sydney, thoughts in relation to thinking about the more difficult conversations with people who are inclined to tune this out or be resistant. Um, Adam, I'll just say, and I and I definitely am curious about Sydney's thoughts about this, but I think that um, it is different for me as a woman of color to engage in some of these conversations because I think that. I find that when I broach these topics with folks, um, there is some natural defensiveness. Um, so I am fortunate not to have encountered too many people who are very overt in, as Molly describes, their very abhorrent views. You know, I might suspect they have them, but I have been fortunate not to have to have not to have encountered too many folks that are just very frank to tell me exactly what they think about me or anybody else for that matter. What I find happens more often though, is that 
um, when we talk about, for example, being the beneficiary of racism, as I've mentioned over and over, and I talk about the privileges that American racism has bestowed, what people tend to do is attach some sense of guilt to that, right? And so, and that's uh, has underscored the argument that you've heard about um, any sort of culturally competent education that we say we don't want our children to feel guilty for the transgressions of their 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 forebears, right? But when I have conversations with folks, I always start by saying, let me just lay out some things that are just facts, right? One of the facts is that we are all beneficiaries of things that we did not create. And it doesn't have to be something so weighty or insidiousness, insidious when we're talking about racism. Anyone who was born in the United States or lives in the United States has certain privileges simply by virtue of being here. And these privileges are fundamental, like turning on a light switch and having electricity. Like generally speaking, I know there's people will say, what about this place or that place? But having water that is potable, that you can turn on the faucet and you can drink out of it, that you can breathe clean air. These are things that we don't even think about as being a privilege. But yet for those who come from outside of this country, for those who have been without that, they say this is a huge privilege. And it's not something to feel guilty about. It's something to recognize that, yes, I have this privilege and I, I'm glad that I have this privilege, but the question should be more, how do we wield the privilege that we have for those who do not have that and they don't have it simply by virtue of circumstance, not by any personal or moral failing of theirs. We need to, to take away the sentiment of guilt when we're talking and, and take away the sentiment that we're being accusatory when we talk about these conversations or talk about these important issues and say, let's just talk about what the facts are, about some things that you know, preceded us, but that we are dealing with currently. How do we talk in this moment to prevent the perpetuation of the inequities that were created at the beginning or the origin of our country? That's how I approach these conversations, as dispassionately as I possibly can. Uh, Thank you I, for that. I wanna... <clears throat> Go ahead, Sorry. I, I wanna say I absolutely agree with Audra and Molly. Um, I believe questions are definitely the way to go. And I, I completely agree with the idea of the defensiveness. Um, I myself am a bit of a confrontational person. And so I am always down to ask the questions that, that need to be asked. But I've, I've learned to ask those questions um, kind of dispassionately, but, but also with an understanding that at the end of the day, everyone wants to have the same thing. Everyone wants to have the ability to have a safe environment, to be able to feed themselves and their family when they want to. And so I try to drill down and ask those questions and find out why do people feel the way they do? Um, as somebody that's worked in police accountability, I can tell you I have had very frank conversations of exactly how people felt about, about how people felt about me and how they felt about the police. And, and I've ultimately been able to have those conversations with staunch uh, military supporters, staunch police supporters, uh, a few Trump supporters, and come from those conversations walking away having a better understanding. It doesn't always mean that you will convince someone of your opinion or that they will convince you of theirs. The point of the conversation is to find out what do we have in common and how can we build from there. We're coming from two very different paths, but trying to reach the same place, how can we maybe move those paths closer? Or how can we maybe understand, even if those paths will never cross, that we want the same thing for ours and our families? Thanks for that, Sydney. And we're gonna stay actually with you for this fourth question, round four, We're dealing with intersectionality and allyship. Intersectionality is framework for understanding how various identities, race, ethnicity, gender, age, and more combine to inform how a person experiences and moves through the world. There's a lot of focus on the discrimination and disadvantages that people with multiple marginalized identities face and not enough on the strengths that they have. Let's talk about intersectionality as an asset rather than as a deficit. So Sydney, in the work to end racism and other forms of bigotry, what advantages does intersectionality bring to the table? And how have you seen allyship help ensure progress for communities of color? The quickest way to break down any form of bigotry I found is to become familiar with those uh, whom a person feels they have an aversion. Um, I'm often in spaces where I'm an only black person, 
I'm the only Jewish person. And unless I'm at my synagogue or with Cole Orr, I'm usually the only black Jewish person. Um, I find that because I hold both of those identities, I'm, I'm allowed to be able to confront black people about their perception of Jews and, and of Jews of their perception of people of color. Uh, because I'm aware that when we discuss racial issues, we also look at things both figuratively and literally as only black and white. When in fact, there are entire groups that are wrongfully left out of those important discussions of acceptance and recognition. Um, one of the tougher issues I tackle um, on both sides actually is Jews being seen as only white. Many people in my generation and younger don't realize white presenting Jews have only been seen that way for less than a hundred years. Um, that perception of all Jews being white is one of the reasons I personally believe it's been so easy to ensure that things that affect the Jewish community, like anti-Semitism or anti-Jewishness, are not only discussed, but in-depth lessons are given about it in some school curriculum. And that hatred is widely condemned, whereas anti-Blackness, getting back to the CRT point, is glossed over in ways that can often feel like we're being gaslit by our country. Um, we're outwardly told that doing or saying racist things are wrong, but we're also punished for pointing out those racist things that are said and done, and often more severely than the ones who, per who per perpetuated it. Um, however, what I have been seeing more and more um, is because of those bridges that are, have been built, uh, particularly in my work between um, predominantly groups of color and predominantly Jewish groups, that allies are stepping up on both sides, calling out the racist and bigoted behavior. Allies are amplifying the voices of those who would otherwise have been silenced. And as people learn things like CRT and how anti-Blackness informs a lot of the ways in which our society runs, we see those relationships growing and working together to fix and break down a lot of those systems. Thank you um, for that, Sydney. Let's move over to round five and it's building on this same theme of what is it that we can do and what actually sort of sits at hand as assets to bring to bear on this struggle. We've already established our country is at a crossroads with basic rights and freedoms in jeopardy like they were in the 1960s during the time of Sergeant Shriver. Even worse, we're watching significant protections against discrimination erode. Think about the attacks on voting rights for black people and other people of color, or the attacks on women's rights, including the recent Dobbs decision, LGBTQ uh, plus rights, and uh, particularly the targeting of transgender youth often happening within the same school systems that CRT is being targeted. But those who remember the 1960s wouldn't be surprised by these backlashes, direct action protests where people sought to achieve results through direct often physical action in terms of bringing their bodies to bear, was the tactical heart of the civil rights movement. And those that practiced this predicted that resistance to progressive change would always intensify. And so in a certain sense, we can't give up this fight. The stakes are really too high. So let's look at these attacks, not only as attacks, but also as calls to activism and calls to stand together in the fight for racial and economic justice. So the question now to all three of you, what small acts can people take that will collectively have a big impact? Are there effective tactics from the past that we might use now? Molly, maybe we can ask you to start. Uh, so clearly I'm obviously I'm not an activist. I'm also not a movement journalist. Um, I am a reporter. Um, so I don't think I can necessarily speak to like what should activists be doing right now? But I do think that we can draw some, um, we can look back at history. And I think one, one thing in particular was just the way that many civil rights activists understood the importance of um, media newspapers and particularly like photography. Um, I think one, one thing I think about is like Rosa Parks' mugshot and how, you know, how important a symbol that was um, for, the civil rights movement. Um, so I would say, I think engaging with, with journalists, um, perhaps that's a contradiction to what I said earlier about historically also the role of lo local papers. Um, but I, I think like, you know, speaking to journalists about what you see going on in your community that you think um, should be written about or should be kind of pointed out 
in a story I think is incredibly important, you know, showing up to these like um, school board meetings, like city council meetings, speaking and making your voice heard is also incredibly important because for the standards of journalism, for how a lot of news articles are written, um, you know, the journalists can kind of only put opinions into the story if there's a quote or another source to back that up. So if you don't speak out, that could mean that your perspective could get in the story, but just the journalist can't put it in because there's not, there's no one to quote. Um, and then I think the other thing I would say is also don't be afraid to like hold the your local reporter accountable to like call out stories you think are not great. Try to explain why you don't think they're they're great. I think internally within newspapers, oftentimes like public pressure can help people make a point about like maybe we don't need to. I think a, a great great example is like the widespread practice of newspapers publishing you know like rolls of mugshots every week for people who are arrested for like petty crimes or drug crimes that is not as widespread a practice anymore because a lot of people spoke out about how abhorrent that was um so yeah I think engaging with with media local media um can be one way to, to help at least like the um kind of local record that's being created through reporting reflect um your viewpoint thank you for that Molly Audra, what would you point to as small acts that not only experts like those assembled on the panel, but that people in the everyday can do that will make a difference? It's interesting. I understand why Molly, as a journalist, would not characterize herself as an activist. But I think that there is such a thing as courageous journalism. And because we know that we talk about prejudice and how it permeates all aspects of our society, and we've seen that reflected in, in journalism and in print and, and other forms of media, I think there is a certain courageousness that it takes to report what you actually see and to present a perspective that is in fact um, as balanced as it possibly can be and shows all aspects. Or if there are inequities or there are transgressions, the, the there is a courageousness to report them as is, understanding that there can be backlash. So um, I, I will respect that you don't call it activism, but I actually do think that it is a form of activism um, to be honest and to be courageous. Um, but I do think to, to the question, there are, it's important to know that there are many remarkable people um, over history, um, over generations who have worked to advance uh, justice, racial justice for Americans. And there's reasons why they are significant and why they are so truly worthy of recognition and these names that we talk about and, and pioneers. But the truth is that everyday acts are probably most significant and they're more important because for as many people as we can name that have been um, lauded for their activism, there are so many more that have been doing things that have been moving the needle. And oftentimes the people that we see who, again, not taking anything away from their greatness, but they wouldn't have gotten there had it not been from the, the small acts and the collective acts of people whose names you'll never know, whose faces you've never seen and will never see. And that is something that we have to, to, to think about, that it's not always the people who get the most attention, but many of those who are behind the scenes. So even when you're talking about Rosa Parks, and Rosa Parks, who was emblematic um, this, you know, of the, the Montgomery bus boycott, there are a lot of people who don't realize that there was a 13-month mass protest that ended with the Supreme Court ruling uh, that segregation of public buses was unconstitutional. And while she was a key and critical part of that movement and that protest, this boycott began years before her arrest. And that you had an entire city who had to find alternate ways to get to work because it was a conscientious and a concerted effort to be able to disrupt uh, the system going to protest. And you will never know the names of all the people who are involved in this. You'll never know all the machinations today, um, but yet those were small acts and the collective small acts that, that yielded what we see today. So I think it's really, really important for people to understand that it doesn't have to be something huge um, to be um, powerful. 
The only other thing that I'll say, just two things quickly. Number one, just yesterday, the state of Illinois is the first state to pass legislation. The Senate just passed legislation that um, to withhold public funding for any library or school that bans books. So legislative action is very important. And again, these were advocates and folks who were on the ground advocating, pushing for this. And we've seen this in our legislature. So they're, they're, this is very impactful. And the other thing that I'll say, um, and for those of you, you might want to look this up. I heard something on the radio about the descendants of Robert E. Lee, who had actually come together and not only did the direct descendants of Robert E. Lee, but also the descendants um, uh, uh, who were uh, former slaves. So the descendants of former slaves and slaves who worked, um, you know, whose, whose ancestors were working uh, on plantations and, and who were very connected to the, uh, Robert E. Lee, all come together and to talk about his legacy. And all of them, and this is black and white, who are talking about the importance of having honest education, and that's what they call it, honest history, honest education, recognizing that here we are, this, this civil rights kind of pillar uh, for some, um, it was recognized for being flawed is recognized for the role that he played. And descendants are willing to say, this is who this person is. And they're, again, that dispassion. They're just saying, this is who this is. We recognize this, who this person is to many, but we also recognize the pain and the transgressions and we acknowledge that. And so even the willingness to have that conversation among these descendants was just so fascinating to me. And the fact that they were able to come together even over this history of shared history of pain, and yet they come together affirmatively positivity and and they are related so little acts small acts i shouldn't say little small acts are very important and actually that's really what carries these movements forward more so than anything else thanks audra sydney anything that you would contribute on that in terms of thinking about the everyday ordinary but nonetheless very significant things that people can do absolutely you do not have to run for office to make a difference. You can just vote. You don't have to know everything about national or even local politics, but if you know enough to discuss with your neighbors or colleagues to help pique their interest in a, a new ordinance or a movement they hadn't heard about, that's making an impact. Find ways to get you and yours involved. My children have already been working on campaigns, canvassing for candidates, phone banking. My son is heading down to Springfield next week. You can show up to your community meetings, as Molly was saying, you know, ask questions of your officials and make sure they give you an answer. Lots of government meetings are public. Show up, ask these questions. But most importantly, in my opinion, don't let anybody try to sidestep your question with a lot of jargon or run on sentences. Anyone good at their job should be able to explain it to you in layman's terms. You deserve to know what's going on, so go find out. Thanks for that, Sydney. We had a question come in from the audience and we have a short amount of time and it's an enormous question, but I'm going to put it out there just so that we can perhaps give a little bit of context, both to the person providing the question and the remainder of the audience. What is it about the attacks on CRT and other efforts to maintain what's called the revisionist history here, but really can be thought of as a kind of supremacist or reactionary and highly selective history? What is it about these attacks that has proven effective so far? And why are people across the society for now prepared to believe what really in many ways is a series of lies? Very quickly, what, how can we assess the effectiveness and how can we maintain a sense that that effectiveness can be combated? Uh, maybe we could start with Audra. I actually said it before. I think that there are some who do not want to stop benefiting from the system that we have today. But I think for many other people, it might be a sense of shame about this history. It's a shame of being associated with that history. It's a shame of knowing that there might be anyone within their own families that could have committed these transgressions, these atrocities, and wanting to distance themselves from that and not wanting any sort of association with that. And unfortunately, as I tell people, I'm like, but that was not of your creation. So you need to let go of that sort of guilt and to recognize that I am here and present. What can I do moving forward to help counteract that legacy instead of trying to take responsibility for it because it's not of your creation? Thanks for that, Audra. Sydney? 
I think it's so easy to believe um, because it's easier to not do the work, to work through that shame, that guilt, but also because we are a very punitive society and we have been indoctrinated to believe that if someone is suffering for whatever reason, that they did something themselves and so no one else is responsible for it. There are no systems, there are no failings, there is no way that I could have possibly helped that person because they have moral failings of their own that they need to work through. Thanks for that. And we'll close with Molly in terms of the panel. I think this is a fascinating question. One one thing I wonder is like, would we believe that the attack on critical race theory is so effective if there weren't so many supermajority Republican legislatures that can just push legislation against CRT through? I think that perhaps what makes it effective is that it kind of takes place within this whole system of conservative TV station like Fox News, um, the Manhattan Institute, all of the think tanks, and then there being like state legislatures that can actually enact these policies. Thank you for that, Molly. And with that, um, we'll close the panel portion of the discussion. I want to thank very, very much Audra, Molly, and Sydney for all of the insights and the contributions they made over the course of the conversation. And now we'll turn it over to Latanya Jackson Wilson. So we've had a very energizing conversation today. Let's keep that minimum, that momentum going. We hope to see you all in the, at our next event in our Civil Rights at a Crossroads series, which will be held in the late fall. Our aim is to put into practice igniting activism for re racial and economic justice. That's why we will uplift the voices and experiences of community activists and organizers from around the country. And in January, 2024, our series with the Sergeant Shriver Peace Institute will conclude with an in-person convening in Chicago around the 60th anniversary of the War on Poverty. You can stay connected to us by coming to our other events. The Shriver Center is celebrating the 10th anniversary of our groundbreaking breaking Racial Justice Institute program this year and save the date for our annual gala on September 28th. Keep reading our monthly newsletter for updates. Thank you all and have a great day.